Because your reception isn't very good. Okay. Probably going to be frozen because... Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, I can't hear you anymore, but it's probably my turn. Okay. Well, might as well just jump in. Um, please ignore any freezing or anything like that. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carmen Jones for our Cannabis is Medicine lecture series. Today, we will be talking about type two uh, diabetes and the endocannabinoid system. So what I do, um, this is so much for this conversation. And just jump right in. Okay, well, good morning. Thank you for having me again. Um, yeah, I hope that the reception holds up because you're kind of in and out on that introduction, but hopefully people watching live can can hear it and if not we'll be touching it up later um after uh the editing process so uh good morning everyone um this is number three in a series of five topics regarding uh various um ailments that cannabis can uh, perhaps help with maybe even things you didn't know I certainly have enjoyed doing this research and bringing this information to you. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen now and we'll get started. Okay, can you see the screen? Is that a yes? Can you see the screen? Okay, well, I am going to go forward. I can't get this little uh, thing here to go away. And it's not my mouse. I thought it was that from last week, but um, let's go ahead. Okay, so good morning again. Cannabis is medicine, is it for you? Again, uh, for those people who have not seen the first two, I'm just gonna kind of give a little background on cannabis. Um, the first two topics we discussed were, uh, the first was obesity, diet and nutrition and how cannabis relates to it. The second was uh, hypertension, heart disease and stroke. So this week we're gonna talk about type two diabetes. But before we get into it, let's go over a little background. For those who don't know, cannabis has been with us for pretty much our entire human existence. From as uh, the records uh, that we can find historically show that its origins began in China over 10,000 years ago. Hemp was one of the earliest plants to be cultivated. If you look at the screen, there's uh, plenty more um, uh, examples all the way down to the bottom one, which you cannot see, um, which talks about in the new world here, George Washington growing hemp on Mount Vernon. Cannabis has always been used in our medicines. Um, prior to the prohibition of uh, 1937, uh, cannabis was used for many different ailments uh, and uh, they only began to restrict it after Prohibition started in 1937 for, I'll just call it political reasons, all the way up to now, where there's the uh, 
hopefully the end of this failed war on drugs. Uh, after alcohol prohibition, they went into marijuana prohibition. And then that itself led to um, President Nixon repealing that Marijuana Tax Act and starting the DEA essentially and putting it on schedule one, along with heroin, LSD and ecstasy, suggesting that it had no medicinal use, despite the fact that we know that it did and, and had been using it widely uh, medicinally uh, prior to, to 1937. Move to today, uh, the farm bill was a big deal in 2018 that allowed hemp to be essentially grown freely in the States and sold. And today, uh, to my count, all but two states have some form of cannabis uh, legislation on the books. However, currently it remains a Schedule One drug. So what are we talking about? These are pictures of the types of cannabis that um, we are aware of. Genetically, this is sativa, indica, and ruderalis. You may have heard of sativa and indica because those are the types of uh, labels that are put on when you go to make a purchase. If you're in a state where you can uh, purchase cannabis, um, the ruderalis is the one that uh, sort of grows wild on the side of the road and currently of no medicinal use, but I know for a fact that they are working on uh, trying to see if it does have some. Cannabis sativa most likely tall, broad leaves and can provide some of the following effects listed there, including creativity, focus, increasing your appetite, decreasing your nausea, helping with pain and fatigue. Cannabis indica is sort of a shorter, bushier plant and smellier even. Uh, some of its common uses include for, uh, in addition to pain, muscle spasms, anxiety, nausea, also can help with your appetite and sleep. All right, so what's the difference? Hemp versus marijuana. Both of these plants are derived from the cannabis sativa uh, variety. The only real difference is the amount of THC that can be extracted from the plant. For hemp, uh, in order for it to be hemp, it has to contain less than 0.3% THC. Uh, and THC is the uh, chemical in the plant that causes the psychoactive effects that you hear about and that people refer to as being high. Okay, so how does cannabis work in the body? We have discovered in the early 90s something called the endocannabinoid system. Um, this is a system that is pretty much present throughout all of our body. And while it is still being researched and probably will forever be researched as we move forward in our lifetime, um, we know it plays a major role in regulating different functions of our body, particularly sleep, mood, appetite, memory, reproduction, and fertility. So whether we add cannabis to it or not, it's there working all the time. I think of it in terms of balancing or even assisting. So if we have these receptors and for simplicity's sake, I've got this schematic up here representing CB1 and CB2. Um, whether, whether we realize it or not, this is always working to assist our body to work at its best level. Um, typically, the CB1 receptors, and, and by the way, this is extremely um, uh, rudimentary the way I'm speaking about this complex system. But in general, the THC type cannabinoids or molecules are reactive uh, in the CB1 system and the CBD uh, uh, molecules or cannabinoids are reactive in the type two system. Again, very elementary 
Um, but you kind of get the picture based on what you're looking at here. So what am I talking about? These are called cannabinoids. And they are uh, present in uh, the plant uh, in various degrees, as I mentioned earlier. Um, far as we know now, the last count I saw was the cannabis plant produces over 120 known cannabinoids. So while we talk about these two most popular ones, THC and CBD, there are tons more. And that is why I was explaining it earlier that it is uh, just the very basics of what I'm teaching today. However, there are many types um, and varieties throughout the plant. In addition to the cannabinoids, we have something called terpenes. I love this picture only because it's just so vibrant and colorful, but terpenes are other compounds found in the plant um, that help produce different flavors and fragrance. But of note, it's not only found in cannabis, terpenes are in all of our plants and foods. It's why uh, uh, we get the piney smell from that pine tree, the lemony smell, you know, and flavor from, you know, the lemon or other citrus fruits. Um, these have been found though, through studies with aromatherapy to also have some medicinal value. So these are very important as you are making uh, choices and trying to understand how cannabis works in your body. Along with the CBDs, the THCs, and the terpenes, all of these cannabinoids work together to produce what you can see at the bottom called an entourage effect, modulating mechanism between the psychoactive and non-psychoactive and uh, all of it working together to help our bodies. And again, I don't know how to remove this um, little uh, banner that's down there. And it is not because of a mouse. I was hoping I could do that, but no. Okay, let's move on. Here are some terpenes. In fact, these are probably the most popular ones that are tested uh, in your plant. So if you make a purchase at a dispensary, in many places you'll have a lab uh, lab uh, uh, form or sticker on, the, on your purchase, and it'll tell you the degree of which you have THC, CBD, or other cannabinoids, including these popular terpenes. And they have determined that they can affect your body in certain ways. Uh, you can look there down that middle column for that. Okay, so who's out there using this cannabis? What we know today is that older adults are more likely to consume cannabis than teens. Um, they say that the use, about, the use among uh, adults over 65 has increased over 300%. And while teenage use is slowing down, um, the statistics suggest that the average, uh, we're averaging over 7,000 new users every day. And this is kind of important because a lot of places and people were worried that the more we introduce cannabis to society, the more influence it may have over youth. But the studies have not bear that out to be true. Okay, what are some conditions that people use cannabis for medically? Well, lots of different conditions, but here are a few listed. Alzheimer's, appetite, Crohn's, cancer, some eating disorders, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, other autoimmune illnesses, glaucoma, muscle spasms, pain, seizures, lots of medical value. I'll just give you a second more to review that list. I like this chart still because 
it kind of gives you a vis vis uh, visual of how cannabis or different types of cannabinoids work in which system. So today, we're going to be talking about the uh, essentially endocrine and immune system part in the corner there, um, upper right corner. If you look down there, uh, number three, the third section, it says reduces blood sugar. And this lists CBD. However, I learned a little something different in my research. So this chart may have to be altered based on what we learned with our research. So let's get into it. So we're gonna talk about diabetes today. What are the common type of diabetes? And I made a distinction here because there are many other types of diabetes from a scientific standpoint, but from the main general population, we're gonna be talking about the three main types of diabetes mellitus. So type one, those are the ones that are insulin dependent. Type two, most common type, and then we, uh, have gestational diabetes. So these are the three most common types of diabetes that we are uh, faced with in our society. So what's type one diabetes? Type one is thought to be caused by an autoimmune reaction. That's when the body attacks itself by mistake and stops the body from making insulin. This is a, a small but significant amount of people, five to 10%. And this usually develops when you're young, a child or a teenager or a young adult. And if you develop this type of diabetes, you will need to take insulin daily to survive. And currently, there's no way to prevent that. So what's type 2 diabetes? This is when the body breaks down, sorry, the body breaks down food uh, into glucose for energy. And then we have insulin in our body that our cells, that our pancreas produces, and it helps essentially break down the glucose so that it can be used for energy by our cells. But in type two diabetes, based on a complex uh, set of circumstances, the insulin that our body naturally produces becomes ineffective essentially. So it's floating around in our system, but not capable of breaking down the glucose. So what happens is when you sort of spot check your blood for the glucose that should have been used for energy by your cells, it's just floating around. It is not being properly used. And this is how, you def how we define type 2 diabetes. And this is usually the type of diabetes that is uh, found in most adults. Gestational diabetes develops when pregnant women uh, have an abnormal uh, problem um, metabolizing their sugar. This usually goes away uh, after the baby is born. However, it does put the mother at risk of having diabetes, type 2 diabetes in the future, and it also puts the baby at risk for being obese and ultimately developing type two diabetes as well. So let's talk about the most common type. Type two diabetes, 90 to 95% of the people uh, have this type, and it can develop over many years uh, and may take a little bit of while to diagnose because sometimes people don't notice the symptoms. They don't know, so they don't necessarily get it tested. Um, this is why annual visits to your favorite doctor is important so that you can get that checkup, especially as we get older and especially if you do not have uh, uh, the best health in general. And if you are uh, of the lifestyle that doesn't eat very well, nor be very active. So these are some of the complications. You can have diabetic retinopathy, stroke, can affect your heart, your nerves. 
your feet, blood flow, and your kidneys. In addition, heart disease, um, I think I mentioned that. Um, thing is with treatment and better lifestyle management, these things can be managed. So again, who are we talking about? Um, this is a really, this was a really scary statistic to me. This says across the US population, around 40% of the people are expected to develop type two diabetes in their lifetime. Um, that's, that's almost one in two of us. So again, that goes back to some of the information that I presented on the first lecture with regards to how Americans are generally unhealthy because we're overweight or obese. And that's one of the main uh, factors for someone getting type two diabetes. Right here, I've listed um, who is most likely for this to occur. It. So first thing, African-Americans, Asians, Hispanics, Latinos, Native Americans and Pacific Islanders. So I think that pretty much covers everyone except for uh, Caucasian Americans who are at risk. And I believe that's the same group that is at risk for obesity as well. If you have a family history, you're most more likely. If you have what they call pre-diabetes, not quite diabetic yet, but you're headed there, you are on the path to type 2 diabetes. And of course, just as I mentioned earlier, that history of genetic, or excuse me, gestational diabetes. So can cannabis help with diabetes? Let's see what the research shows. All right, there was a milestone study done in or it's 2013 through the, um, from the American Journal of Medicine that some cannabis compounds may help control blood sugar. Marijuana users likely to be obese and have, oh, are less, because marijuana users are less likely to be obese, um, they actually, can have some good outcomes that help contribute towards preventing type two diabetes. So I hope that was clear. What I'm trying to show here is that these are benefits of pe from people who use cannabis, that their blood sugar is controlled, they, may they are less likely to be obese, and they have smaller waistlines, higher levels of good cholesterol. All of those things are on the good side of not developing type 2 diabetes. So a uh, group called American Alliance for Medical Cannabis suggested marijuana might have these following benefits. Stabilizing the blood sugar again, lowering arterial inflammation. We know cannabis has anti-inflammatory properties. Um, reducing neuropathic pain, meaning the nerve pain that a lot of times people have uh, with diabetes, the reason that they may have uh, a foot injury and not know it, it's because their nervous stimulation is not as effective as it was, as it once was. Uh, causes vasodilation or keeps the blood vessels open, which may reduce blood pressure over time and improve circulation. Uh, provides uh, relief from muscle cramps and especially when it comes to GI pain and cramping. People with diabetes get this horrible thing called gastroparesis, meaning your stomach kind of freezes up and doesn't, not only doesn't digest or process your food well, but it, it doesn't move. Kind of similar to your, your nerves, not being able to feel how to make your stomach work throughout um, the way it used to. All right, I mentioned this earlier, some other benefits for people. Um, smaller waist size and lower risk of obesity. This is commonly found, as you may remember from the first lecture. Um, so because obesity is one of the major risk factors, 
using cannabis may put you in a better light because of these things. Uh, increased insulin sensitivity. If you remember earlier, I was talking about how actually the insulin, although it may be produced in your body, is no longer effective in type 2 diabetes. So cannabis may help increase that sensitivity and return it to more of a normal state. This is something that I was pretty surprised to learn in my research for this presentation. This says, uh, in a larger study, scientists observed that fasting insulin levels were lower than those of both former users and non-users. And the level of insulin resistance among this group was also lower. So that's good news. That means that the insulin being released naturally is effectively being used up pushing that glucose into the cells so that it can be properly used for uh, energy that the body needs. Excuse me. So additional possible benefits. This was also compelling. A lot of times people with diabetes will have complications with their eyes. They'll have, um, increased eye pressure and fluid um, in, in their eyes, and, and that's associated with, or sorry, it's called glaucoma. And they may also have something called diabetic retinopathy, where you have a restriction of blood flow to the back of the eye. They're saying cannabis can help with that, uh, possibly as well, De by decreasing the fluid pressure in the eye and increasing the blood flow, as we have learned in the previous lectures. All right, so this is the thing that also kind of we have come to learn, and that's what's the difference between the effects of THC and CBD with diabetes. So most of the studies are showing that while we know TB, THC and CBD are different, that it's actually the THC that helps to improve your blood sugar and lipid levels in people with diabetes. So while CBD did also help lower insulin resistance and boost the gut hormone level, it wasn't the actual uh, cannabinoid that helped to improve the blood sugar. That was THC. And that's where most of the studies are headed right now. Out there, they're doing a lot more THC-centered studies for diabetes. What if you have type 1 diabetes? Can you use cannabis? Well, the short answer is yes, but it becomes a little bit more complicated for those patients. And at first I was concerned because I'm sure there are similar benefits uh, from a chemical standpoint, but from a practical standpoint, it may not be the best. And here's why. Um, if you have type 1 diabetes, your person who may have to, who has to pay attention to what their blood sugar is doing in their body almost all the time, um, they are on insulin. So uh, they have what we call highs and lows. And so if you are using cannabis or something that may cause your perception to be altered, you may not be able to feel that normal high or low that you count on to tell you how your body is doing at any given moment. And that could result in some, uh, let's just say dangerous results. Um, if, they, if you do choose to use cannabis, you should check your blood sugar regularly. Again, your perception is off perhaps, and you need to make sure you remain in a safe range. Um, a lot of times people using cannabis may get the munchies that people have talked about. In general, that's not so bad for your regular person, but without uh, type 1 diabetes, but if you have type 1 diabetes, that could be a problem because you could munch your way into um, uh, increasing your blood sugar too rapidly or too high. 
And that also can be a problem in terms of management and recovery. And then finally, there's a caution that if you use edibles in terms of edible cannabis products, let's say that brownie, that is not something you may have uh, expected to add to the diet. And that could also turn your blood sugar into a nightmare to monitor and cause you to be super, uh, super high uh, or altered. Okay. So what do I eat? Well, just like uh, in the lectures before, there's beautiful food out there for us to eat. And most diabetics are aware of the diabetic diet. So embrace it. We all should. This diet is a little bit different than the one um, that's recommended for the general public um, because of their complex issues with uh, blood sugar metabolism but they recommend that half of the plate be filled with non-starchy vegetables. Only a quarter of this plate in diabetes, uh, in the diabetic diet should be carbohydrates, but not simple. This is important, complex carbohydrates. And that refers to your, you know, mostly your grains. And then a quarter of the plate, some lean protein. If you notice, there's that glass of water there. So in the uh, regular uh, plate recommendations, that's the glass of milk representing get some dairy in, but here, water or non-sweetened drink. And don't forget to work it out. This is something that we all need to do in, in no matter what uh, condition our, we find our health in. Don't forget to hydrate. This is probably the most important thing. None of us get enough water. Most adults are dehydrated on a regular basis, but we should all be drinking half of our weight in ounces of water every day. So if you're a 200 pound person, should we be drinking 100 ounces of water a day? That's quite a bit, that's almost a gallon. Hard to do, but with practice and persistence, it's better for us in the long run. Please slow it down every now and then. All of our health will be greatly improved if we just sit down and be quiet for a while. We also want to encourage you to do it intentionally. Be mindful. Not just quiet, but be mindful plenty of apps on your phone that you can download to help you with this. And finally, or yeah, I believe that's close to final. Um, I mentioned this last couple of times, it's in your DNA. So there's a company, there are several companies, but this one I've partnered with called EndoDNA. And they actually can help direct you in terms of what type of cannabis is good for you and your uh, system from the basic, from a genetic standpoint. So for instance, if you're um, just not getting the results you want for whatever ails you, um, maybe it's time to get some DNA and see why that is. All right, for those of you who don't know, there are many different ways to use cannabis. Everything from smoking it, inhalation, using flour or vape, or concentrates to eating it. They make, uh, as I say all the time to patients, everything from nasal sprays to suppositories. It just depends on, you know, what's going on with you and how you prefer to consume the, the medicine. Uh, inhalation gives you the quickest results. Usually within minutes, you're having, uh, you're feeling the effects of the cannabis. Uh, second uh, most rapid absorption is those tinctures under your tongue. Uh, people may have called it um, CBD oil, 
those usually are for under the tongue and um, uh, you can begin feeling the effects of that in 10 to 20 minutes. And finally, if you're using the edibles, those take the longest because naturally they have to go through your GI system before they can get into your bloodstream and start working. But depending on what's wrong, what you're trying to do, you can have that discussion with your doctor or uh, the person uh, behind the counter uh, helping you make the purchase. I love this app because this helps you to keep track. So if you're using cannabis medically, you really do want to keep track of what you're doing. You may go and buy this product uh, one week, try something new the next, and decide that the one you liked first was two weeks ago and you don't remember what it is. So this is very important. This app here helps you keep track of uh, what you tried, how it made you feel, and other um, measures. So download that. Where are we going with this? I just updated this chart yesterday because I realized that even more states have started to legalize cannabis and or decriminalize it and uh, or allow adults to use it uh, recreationally. So now we have 18 states that are just allowing you to walk in the door and make a purchase of cannabis. Um, still a controlled substance under the uh, DEA, but just this week, these guys uh, finally started to unveil the marijuana descheduling plan. And I think it was July 15th that they did this. So let's see what happens. Finally, I believe we may make some uh, headway in this regard. Remember, weed is from the earth. God put this here for me and for you. Take advantage, man. Take advantage. And again, I thank you and appreciate uh, you for listening and having me. Uh, these talks are sponsored by CEIC, the Cannabis Equity and Inclusion Community of Nevada. And I will now stop sharing my screen. And see where we are. All right. Oh, all right. I'm back. That Hi. was great. Hello. That was great. Um, that was a great presentation. Very informative. Um, Chandler said, a joint a day keeps diabetes away. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that I guess it keeps a lot, a lot of things away. Yeah, we're learning a lot of things. Okay, cool. We have Krista backstage. She doesn't have her camera on. Um, the questions from us, I'll let her get ready if she wants to join us. But I have a couple of questions um, related to the conversation. Um, if I was a person who was already using cannabis and I have type two diabetes, why should I go see a doctor to learn more about it, to learn more about cannabis? If I've already used it, I'm already my everyday life, why should I consult with a doctor about it? Well, one thing, is that when you are seeing your doctor regularly, there's monitoring that occurs. So there's blood work uh, metrics, including your weight, your blood pressure, your pulse. These things are monitored every time you go to the doctor. So a lot of times people, and this happens every day in every practice, day. Uh, people will come and say, um, I'm using cannabis because I don't want to use pharmaceuticals. And that's that. I said, well, what are you using it for? And they said, well, my back hurts. I said, well, what's wrong with your back? Well, I don't know. Well, one thing that we have to all remember is that 
you need a diagnosis before you can treat something. So mm -hmm. while yes, we can treat symptoms, it's not always a good idea to just go off on your own treating a symptom, especially for something serious. So you need to have constant monitoring of whatever the ailment is. First, you get the diagnosis. Then you say, what are we gonna do to treat this thing? Anything from cancer to muscle pain, but at least mm -hmm. you have a diagnosis to start with and you can say, okay, well, my choices are pharmaceutical, uh, surgery, physical therapy, um, or, or an alternative therapy. Okay, well, I don't wanna do those other things. I want the alternative therapy. Well, what, what's that? Are we talking about acupuncture, massage therapy, chiropractic, cannabis? There's an order to things. So people need to develop a relationship with a regular, uh, a, a regular practicing physician or primary care doctor. Now, how you choose to treat whatever you end up having is a whole other thing, but the diagnosis and the monitoring must be there. And I encourage all of the patients that I see to do this, despite their disdain for us these days. <laughs> okay. So someone with, with type two diabetes should already be visiting a physician. So the bonus right. is also having a doctor who understands cannabis, using it, they, and then you can monitor. No, they may not understand anything about cannabis, but they will be able to track how you're doing. So in other words, let's say your blood sugar was out of control. You started mm -hmm. to use cannabis. And then six months later, the doctor goes, hey, I see your blood sugar numbers are better. Um, have you been following your diet? What have you been doing? And you can say, well, yes, I have been following my diet. I have been exercising, but I've also added cannabis to the program. And so therefore, um, he's got a, they've got a record of how you're progressing. They may not know anything about it. They just see on paper that your numbers that we measure are better. That's okay, happened. That's that right. happens. That happens. All right. Yes. Well, that's great news. That is great news. Um, have you seen anything regarding kids with type 2 diabetes and cannabis when you were going through your research? No. No, because first of all, um, it's a sad, sad fact in America that we have more children with type 2 diabetes than we ever did. And this is all based on our lifestyle. None of this has to happen. So long before I talk about cannabis with a cannabis uh, for a child, I'm going to be talking about um, getting that child on a better uh, uh, exercise program, getting them in some sports, getting them a uh, better diet. Long before that, we aren't. That's that. That's not something I would recommend at all. So cannabis is not cannabis. I'm sorry. Type two diabetes is mainly a symptom of poor eating habits. Maybe I shouldn't say poor, but a certain type of eating habits. Yeah. So one of the slides that I showed um, discussed the risks of who gets it. So mostly it occurs in people that are obese, um, uh, bad diets, poor activity family history, uh, African-American and or people of color in general and or people with a family history. So those are the risk factors for people who can develop it. Okay. Yeah, because I remember there was a kid when I was in middle school, he had diabetes and I was just like, I wasn't sure. Well, now that was. I'm older, I remember it's odd because he wasn't obese at all. He was... Very well, normal. that's because that's because he probably had type one diabetes, not type two. So there's a very big mm. difference. So kids typically have type one, adults get type two. 
if a child has type 2, it is because of their weight and poor uh, lifestyle. So that's why I said type 2 kids, we're going to get them straight first with their lifestyle long before we start adding cannabis. Type 1 is what they used to call juvenile diabetes, meaning it occurred in children, teens, and young adults. I've heard that term. Um, what is, what's a poor lifestyle? What does that mean? Poor diet, sedentary, meaning you don't get up and move around a lot. Don't get in any exercise. If you're an adult, you may be drinking, smoking, uh, poor lifestyle for okay. your health. You might be drinking. Well, and is there a certain most, type of? I'm sorry. I was gonna There's say um, <laughs> the food. When you say poor eating, poor eating. Um, so basically, you're not eating vegetables. You're probably eating hot pockets and burritos and, and tostinos. I think that America suffers mostly because our food, the quality of our food, is. It's not that it's not available to most, it's not easy. And we like things fast. We like drive throughs We like um, convenience, things that we can pop into a microwave. All of these things are processed and these processed foods are not good for us. Convenience, yes, at the, at the, at the uh, you know, the, the risk of our health. We all know and have some friend that's um, a vegan, um, and, and that's cool. That's important to try and adjust your lifestyle, but we have to be careful. Even people who are vegan have a lot of processed food in their diet. That is, unless they're eating whole foods, meaning yeah, they're grabbing that, that celery and eating that, not uh, some thing that looks like a hamburger that they created out of some vegetables and did all sorts of manipulation to to make it look like a hamburger. Just eat the hamburger. That's at least a whole food, not the bread, the meat. But um, all of these impossible, or let me not, you know, disparage a brand, but they had to do a whole lot of work to those um, patties to make them taste and look like a burger when they're made of, made from a plant. So keep that in mind as you make choices. Whole foods are best. Um, okay. Processed foods, not so much. Okay. Um, yeah, that's very informative. I did the vegan thing once upon a time, but I never did the processed meat. I did vegetables and I used to season them a lot. So I don't know if that was bad, but I put a lot of seasoning. Um, Chandler said, will edibles have a different effect on how it treats diabetes compared to smoking it? Uh, no, not in general. It's just that with edibles, a lot of times they use uh, what we call isolates. Um, at least if they're manufactured by uh, uh, a company, they will have already used, they will use some isolates to make their edibles. Um, if you're doing it from home and you're using your own, um, let's say you have a butter machine and you put the plant and it extracts the oil there, that's a little bit better because at least you're getting the whole plant. Um, but in terms of over time, it affecting diabetes, um, no, we just want you to get it in. And again, everything has to be in balance. Everything has to be um, in order. You know, nothing is new under the sun. Just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Everything in moderation. Okay. Um, question. Um, if someone was pre-diabetic, 
would you suggest that they use cannabis to start trying to as a preventative measure? Would you say, would you just throw that in or would you say, you know, just focus on the diet? Cannabis is not going to save you or is it something that could potentially help if you want to change my diet? Oh, that's a very good question. And the way you asked it at the end changed my answer. So, okay, what's <laughs> so a person with pre diabetes can get a hold of it by improving their lifestyle, including diet and exercise and meditation, because we want to lower our stress. Stress is a very big deal when it comes to blood sugar. So then your question was, what if a person with prediabetes uses cannabis and then that motivates them essentially to do those things they're supposed to? That's a very big possibility. And that actually I've seen in real life uh, with patients many times. They will come in because they want to use cannabis for their anxiety or an ache or pain Turns out the ache or the pain got better. That made them want to be more active. They started working out, eating better. Next thing you know, they come back a year later telling me they've lost 40 pounds just because they felt better. Mm -hmm. So that is why I said, uh, that was an interesting way you posed the question. That scenario happens way more than you think. Someone feels bad, so they take cannabis to feel better with whatever. And as a side effect, they got motivated to do other things and therefore improve their health in general. That is um, very inspiring. Okay, so using it as a motivator to do other things, I definitely see that in my own life at times. Um, we have some questions from Krista. She said, um, what do you think about setting the classification system straight? We should be focusing on terpenes and cannabinoids, not indica, sativa, and hy or hybrids. What, what's your thoughts on that? I agree. I don't recall focusing on indica sativa or hybrid in the lecture. I mentioned that they were in existence because a lot of people will walk into a dispensary and that's what they're gonna be confronted with. So I simply mentioned them uh, in terms of uh, uh, their existence. And I did uh, mention terpenes and cannabinoids. I did not mention flavonoids, although I certainly can add that slide just trying to keep things um, oh, as simple as possible. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, terpenes yeah. were mentioned a whole, a whole, uh, uh, a whole uh, slide on cannabinoids, et cetera. But absolutely good point. Um, for people who are new, um, it's really difficult though, until they get a good handle on what they need, what they want, why they're using it. Because um, again, they're going to walk into a dispensary and they're gonna see those other words. And then as they learn more, I almost every patient that I talk to, after I spend time with them teaching them this, I know that they leave and their head is going because they've just been dumped with so much information. So what I tend to do is allow them to absorb that information. I then give them some uh, information to read and send them to different websites to learn. And then I tell all of them, I need you to become super nerdy about cannabis. Because if you're going to be using this as medicine, I'm gonna need you to learn. And so we can start the ball. Yes, Krista, I see the comment that we have to educate them and, and we do. But a lot of times different, you know, people have different learning curves and different interests. So um, I can say the same thing 
you know, to two different people and they heard two different things. So there's importance in repetition. There's importance in uh, self-education as well. So I encourage that constantly. But thank you for your comment. Um, I would like to piggyback off Krista. What are flavonoids? Um, they're in cannabis and we smoke them. Well, I guess I smoke them because that's how I consume, but yeah, what so so when you have, so when you have uh any plant, um just like you have a body that has anatomy, you know, arms, legs, hair mouth, nose, etc. cetera, a plant can be broken down into various parts as well. And so I did not go very deeply into the botanical structure of the plant. Yeah. And many, many people in the cannabis industry are super experts on the botanical um, um, parts of the plant. So flavonoids are one of those components. So um, when you break down the plant, right now I was focused on the chemical component of it or the cannabinoids and terpenes are one of the pieces of anatomy, the little crystally uh, things on the plant. Sugary, they look mm -hmm. like little sugary dots and then the little hair, the little hairs are the flavonoids. Oh, trichomes. Oh. Thank you, Krista. Okay. And basically those have some healing properties and well, they are not they, they are not studied right now as uh, extensively as the cannabinoids. You have to remember the scientific community is catching up to the cannabis community. The people in the cannabis community have anecdotal data and the scientists are trying to verify that. So there the right. reason we talk about the reason we talk about using the whole plant is because of those things. The fact that there's terpenes, cannabinoids, trichomes, flavonoids, all mixed together. They don't know what's causing it to work. And the scientists even use this term, it's a dirty plant. And they mean it's so complex it mucks up the research. So they're gonna have to, at some point decide, do we just accept the plant and eat it or, you know, smoke it or in, consume it? Or do we need to, you know, ferret it all out? I'm sure there's somebody right now taking off, uh, you know, terpenes and testing them to see if it's right. Yeah. My suspicion is they will not be able to prove what we say because you need the entire plant to work together. That's the entourage system. And that's how um, we have defined it for ourselves in the community. Okay. All right, well, I got one more question. How do you see the, um, the federal act? I, I can't remember what it's called, but they're pushing for, you mentioned it, they're pushing for federal, to take it off of the Substance Act, mm -hmm. Control Substance Act. Um, what do you think that means for physicians like you? Um, I know you can say a whole bunch, I know you can expand very widely on that subject, but what do you think that means for, let's just say medical patients then? Uh, wow, okay. So I believe that my colleagues in medicine are easily 10 years behind. Um, they will have to learn very quickly, um, but what removing it off the schedule will do would, would for physicians is it will take off the fear. A lot of doctors are afraid if they discuss cannabis, if they, uh, even sign papers sometimes for patients to get a medical license that somehow that's going to challenge their own livelihood via restricting their licenses. So that's why if you've ever been to your doctor mm -hmm. and you ask them about it, they'll say, well, I can't talk about it or I don't know anything about it. 
we've been conditioned so much to be afraid um, because it was put in the schedule one category of dangerous uh, drugs that can cause harm and have no medical value that we just want to stay away from it because most every physician has a DEA license to protect, me included. Uh, but I had a talk with about three or four attorneys before I got into the field to figure out what I could and could not do and say. And so I am here because I asked, because I found interest and value in it. Um, they, a lot of them will rather not bother just to be safe. I understand that, but in terms of teaching, in terms of what we need to do to help patients, they have a they have a steep learning curve. Uh, and I, I mean, it'll get there. It's just can we can we coexist harmoniously? Because you know, scientists and doctors are always trying to put something in a pill. The cannabis yeah. community tends tends to be very. Um, the cannabis community tends to be very, uh, you know, free and natural and holistic. And so part of why I sit in this space is because I'm trying to be that bridge between the Western medicine doctors and the holistic cannabis community. And so hopefully, you know, I can be successful there. I definitely can see it being an industry that could take off. I mean, I'm hoping that it does. Sounds like it's a lot of gaps in our understanding of how cannabis could be used medicinally, even though there's um, evidence that has been used during ancient civilizations or communities. Um, so it would be nice for us to get back to you know those practices. Actually, another good point you made, um, you know, people uh, in all cultures have ancient uh, remedies. And even even in our culture, um, you know, we may have something where our grandmother used to make us swallow this horrible elixir or whatever. Um, or, you know, go get cider vinegar and honey, you know, whatever old fashioned remedy. The thing is, that is kind of how yeah. cannabis is viewed because while that remedy may have worked that your grandmother you know, made you do, um, it can't be proven or properly scientifically taken through the right path of studies to make it valid in the Western medical community. But just because it can't or hasn't been taken down that path does not mean it doesn't work because I may not be able to test whether grandma's apple cider vinegar and honey mixture works for my sore throat. I know I feel better. So some of it we are not going to be able to prove. But in Western medicine, um, they, I mean, it, it has to be proven for it to be factual. So a lot of times when you hear doctors or politicians especially say, we need to do more research. Well, the research has been done, a lot of it. They just need to validate it and accept it. And I also think they should be less willing to, they should not say that as much because other countries have done extensive research, particularly Israel. And we need to honor that effort and review that data, not reinvent the wheel, just because we are in America. All right. <laughs> that was informative, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for everybody that's here, that's listening in. Thanks for your questions. Let me see if we got a couple more. I wanna just skip people. All right, looks like we answered our questions. Krista said, and <laughs> to what you just said about Western medicine. Um, so make sure you join us next Saturday for our next Cannabis is Medicine. Um, we will be talking about, what are we talking about next week? Female and male um, issues? 
Uh, no, that's last. We're going to be talking next week about autoimmune conditions and sickle cell. That's right. We're going to be we're talking about autoimmune and sickle cell. Make sure you go to Dr. Jones' website, Wildflower. Uh, medical.com. Check her out, set up your appointment, get more familiar with um, cannabis as a treatment option and other holistic methods that she offers. Uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook. I mean, make sure you like us on Facebook. Make sure you follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you again. We will see y'all next Saturday at Cannabis is Medicine. All Thank right. You. Enjoy Bye. your Saturday. Bye-bye.